Hola, soy Sophie, and for the next four minutes, I'm gonna be your tour guide on all things Yinka Shonibari. As sure as I am that you'd love to listen to me talk like this for the rest of the video, I can't do that without getting grounded. Anyway, Yinka Shonibari was a pretty rad dude in a pretty rad motorized wheelchair because he had a not rad spinal disorder. Spinal disorders are not rad. Shonibari was born in 1962 in a neat old city called London, England. He stayed there until he was three years old, but he'd later return at 18 to study fine art. At three, though, he and his family hopped on a plane and headed over to their homeland, Nigeria, for the majority of his childhood. In his later teen years, however, he'd develop a neurological disorder in his spine called transverse myelitis, which caused one side of his body to become permanently paralyzed. But you know what he said to that? He said, screw you, transverse myelitis. Nuh-uh. I'm gonna head back to London and study me some fine art and create me some cool things. Which brings us to Shonibari's The Swing after Fragonard. This is The Swing after Fragonard by Yinka Shonibari based off of The Swing by Fragonard, which is from the Rococo period of early France. Currently, it is in London and was created in 2001 by Shonibari's team of assistants, considering he is wheelchair-bound. The media includes fake foliage, a mannequin, and Dutch wax fabrics. In the piece, we see all of the fundamental parts of Fragonard's original oil on canvas. We see a woman situated on a swing in luscious skirts that float around her. She lifts her right leg flirtatiously into the air as her slipper is flung off, a symbol of her promiscuity. It is a frozen moment in time. However, take a look at the installation in comparison to the oil painting. Although they are strikingly similar, there are two obvious differences in particular that set them apart. The skirts, for example, as opposed to the pastel rococo pink, they've been replaced by geometric, almost African patterns and bright, flashy colors. Another would be the absence of the head on the sculpture, whereas, obviously, in the oil painting, the woman has a head. These two obvious differences each have their own interpretations, the absence of a head being a nod to the grisly use of the guillotine against French aristocracy in the reign of terror of the 19, sorry, 1790s, and the patterns on the lady's skirts jabbing its stereotypical quote-unquote ethnic representation in modernist pieces. Let's take a closer look at the skirts. There's a lot of weight behind the patterning and coloration of them, which Shonibari did intentionally. The fabrics are abstract and geometric, almost typical, quote, African, or foreign and tribal looking. The bright golds, reds, and blues in the motifs are very stereotypical of African culture and art. This refers to appropriation of the cultural style into modernist pieces. Shonibari uses the patterns as means of exploring the stereotype as it can only be assumed that these patterns are African. The fabrics are neither Dutch nor African. The symbolism in the skirts actually has a lot in common with the overall function of the installation. With this, Shonibari meant to establish connections between the French Revolution, the Enlightenment, and the colonial expansion into Africa that was going on at the time of those other two. Shonibari designed the piece by choosing allegories that are popular and easily recognized for stereotyping race, class, corruption, and greed. He conveys the idea that history is a construction. For example, coming back to the idea of the mannequin being headless, more specifically, like a faceless idea of a culture, invites us as an audience to think of the time in which the installation was created, 2001, after 9-11. This refers particularly to the aftermath of 9-11, the building tensions between races and classes. It's almost a modern take on the colonizing of Africa and the French Revolution, don't you think? As if Shonibari is trying to take us back to the time of the swing in comparison to the current time of 2001. Taking a look at another work by Shonibari, here is the scramble for Africa. Like the swing after Fragonard, the same Dutch wax fabric is shown in the suits, hence the geometric patterns and the bright colors. 
It was created in 2003 and includes 14 mannequins, 14 chairs, and a long table. Do you know what I think of when I see the swing after Fragonard? I think of Hawaii, because that's a logical path of thought. Whoa! Right, right there. Did I just hear you ask yourself, what is that cool thing that guy is wearing on his cool self? Well, let me tell you, that thing right there is an Ahua Ua feather cape from Hawaii. And this cool thing is a segue into our next image. The Ahuula feather cape is from pre-1850s Hawaii. It's made of a lot of fiber and feather. These capes were traditionally worn by Hawaiian male nobility as spiritual protection against harm. Only high-ranking chiefs and warriors of great nobility could be permitted to wear Ahuula capes. Ahuula refers to the color, roughly translating to red garments. In Hawaiian culture, the color red was associated with chiefs and gods. As they were viewed as being protective of the wearer, these cloaks would be worn alongside a cap into ceremonies and battle. Each cape is custom to the man it suits. The neckline was shaped specifically to fit the wearer, and no two designs on the cape were the same. These cloaks commanded respect and were highly valuable, but not only for their prestige. This is due to the scarcity of yellow feathers in Hawaii. The Ahu'u would made their way to Europe when a Hawaiian chief confused a sea captain and his crew, Captain Cook, for one of their primary gods, Lono, and laid a number of the cloaks at their feet. Now, take a look at each of these images. On the outside, they seem like they have nothing in common. They're from two different cultures from two different corners of the world. However, taking a step deeper, they're a lot more similar than someone might think. Both Shonabari and the Hawaiian Ahu'ula capes utilize color to convey a deeper meaning. Take the swing, particularly the ladies' skirts. As discussed previously, the skirts contain complex symbolism that link historic events from France to Africa all together. It's the Dutch wax fabric the colors of the Dutch wax fabric, the rich reds, golds, and blues that draw the trade of thought from this French Rococo woman suspended on a swing to colonization in Africa. Similarly, the color nearly defines the Ahu'ula cape, red. The bold presence of red is what connects the wearer to the ultimate function. To revisit what has previously been stated, red is the color of Hawaiian royalty. Although the colors exhibit separate meanings, what connects the two works is the fact that the use of color is the same. Each of the works use color as symbolism to convey the ultimate meaning. <laughs>